I'd like officially to welcome you to the 10th annual Together His Disability History Month Festival. And as I said a little earlier, I would never have believed when I led the T Together 2012 Festival as a volunteer for the UK Disabled People's Council that our planned one-off event would still be going strong in 2021. We set up Together 2012 CIC in 2013 in response to demand from our 2012 audience members and participants who asked not just for an annual festival, but also for a year-round continuation of the creative workshops that we included for disabled people. Today, we're a national portfolio organisation of Arts Council England, who've supported our festivals and summer professional development programmes from 2013 onwards. Our year-round clubs programme, originally delivered entirely by volunteers, has been supported by the National Lottery Community Fund since 2019. Many thanks to both funders for making this festival possible, with an extra thank you for the Lottery, who found a way to extend our funding to cover some of the additional costs of working during the pandemic. Thanks as well to our Community Advisory Board for their ongoing support. If you're interested in the Board's work and perhaps in joining, drop us a line at info at together2012.org.uk. This is the second of our festivals to be delivered online due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our festivals are led by disabled artists and are inclusive of all disabled audience members. While non-disabled people may already have returned to semi-normal, life will probably never be the same for many of us who live with impairments and long-term health conditions. Before COVID, we documented our work on our website to widen access and create a record for the future. Now we deliver our work mainly via the internet with a web-based join-in from home program and weekly live stream and a clubs program that takes place by Zoom and phone. Article 30 of the UN Charter on the Rights of... No, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities gives us the right to access the arts on equal terms. No one should have to risk their health or their life or the people they live with in order to access art, culture and company. Our events industry conference on 24th of November offers a unique opportunity for disabled people and events organisers to discuss a future that's inclusive of disabled people, both in person and via digital services. Working online has brought us many benefits, along with the inevitable losses. We are fundamentally a pop-up organisation and we began by running activities in community venues across the borough, bringing art to people's doorsteps rather than expecting them to travel to unfamiliar places instead. However, many of the community spaces that we used previously, and particularly the 21st century ones with better access, have now been closed or repurposed. And this includes Stratford Circus Arts Centre, which provided the only professional standard stage. Before COVID, we were faced with difficult choices in terms of locating activities outside of Newham. Now we take work directly into people's homes instead, wherever they live, team members, clubs participants, and many of the artists we work with have all gained valuable new digital skills and confidence as a result together with the increased self-confidence, creative skills and social networks that have always been part of our goals. Many disabled people still lack the resources and training to access online activities. But when we are able to connect with each other online and make use of the resources we have at home, whether this is a simple pen and piece of paper to write poetry or draw a still life, or kitchen recycling that we can make into crafts, this is critical to our well-being. So here we are at the start of Disability History Month again, and all three of the exhibitions opening tonight are tied to the historic times in which we find ourselves. Vince Laws and Duncan Bridgestock have created work directly in response to the pandemic, as we will be discussing in a minute. The Together 21, 21 Open Exhibition brings together work created at home when it was too dangerous to go out, work created while participating online, and work created as in-person groups have become 
begun tentatively to meet again from a mix of amateur, community and professional disabled artists, all with a Newham connection. All of, those, all of that work has been fundamentally changed in nature by translating it into a digital form. While the potential audience is now much greater at the same time as the audience experience being fundamentally different. These are three exceptionally strong and vibrant exhibitions and I would like to extend my congratulations and thanks to all of the artists, as well as to open exhibition curators, Sarah Hughes and Alison Marchant and gallery assistant, Emily Welsh. We have a wonderful month of free events and activities ahead of us. From East London, ACT UP Newham brings us postcode stories on Tuesday, 23rd of November. Sahira Khan presents a new performance about community safety on Tuesday 30th of November and cellist Joanne Cox performs and presents her Define Your Journey interactive online project on Tuesday 7th of December. Newham residents will also be well represented when the Together Pop-Up Poetry Cafe returns on Thursday 2nd of December. All events begin at 7pm with virtual doors opening at 645 and all of the events have BSL interpretation and live captions. Before that, next Tuesday, 16th of November, festival favourite Sign Dance Collective preview excerpts from their new work, Oriente Plus, performing from the New European mainland and North America. On Thursday the 18th, our very own Julie Newman will be introducing an evening of new comedy and comic poetry with Helena Ascoff from the north of England and Cheryl McClellan and Wendy Young from London. The following week, on Thursday 25th of November, we host Here is Digital Opera. We ask these questions of everybody. Based on a personal independent claimant's experience, and that's followed by a discussion with the composers and cast. And all of our events include conversations that the audience can join in. The festival also includes two workshops for deaf and disabled people on Monday 22nd of November. At 11am, Sign Dance Collective lead an online dance workshop and at 2.30pm, DL Williams leads a sign poetry workshop. As with all of our events, booking details are on our website or just email info at together2012.org.uk for the links. Then we end the festival with our traditional party on Thursday 9th of December, hosted by our very own Paralympian, Robin Surgeon at MBE, also known as Angry Fish. He'll be introducing emerging disabled musicians from across the UK who featured on our live streams this year. The 10th anniversary of London 2012 is less than a year away. And the future of the Paralympic legacy in East London is still uncertain. Our own core funding becomes due for renewal with no certainty that it will be continued. As I've said, the safe community run space is available to disabled people who've mostly been lost, together with the funded disabled people's organisations locally that existed at the time of the bid. Austerity, as we know, has created many changes. The only new cultural facilities are in the Olympic Park, which had become entirely inaccessible to us by 2018. However, I know that today, the late David Morris, head of external inclusion at London 2012, and the inspiration behind, London, behind Together 2012, would be delighted at the legacy that disabled people have created for ourselves in the last decade, we judge everything by saying, what would David think of this? And I know that looking at the three exhibitions we're launching tonight, he would have been as pleased and proud and excited about them as I am. So I'd like now to just invite the Mayor of Newham, Roxana Fiaz, to say a few words to formally open the festival. And then we're going to be joined by some of the artists. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, and apologies in advance for some of the background noise. I'm doing one of those um, uh, incredible things that you can do now with Zoom. You can be um, uh, stepping out of one meeting, going into the other, and you can be anywhere in the world, albeit I'm not anywhere in the world. I am uh, in London, albeit not in Newham this evening. Um, look, I just 
wanted to firstly convey my um, ongoing thanks, appreciation and pride in everything that Together 2012 um, have been doing since its inception and for the courageous leadership of Jude Goslin in particular for her ongoing uh, and forceful uh, defence of the rights of inclusivity, particularly as it pertains to our members of our disability community here in Newham. We've, um, it's not been an easy relationship for Ju with regards to the council and the issues that she has touched on in her introductory remarks with regards to inclusive spaces, spaces for disability, uh, disabled communities and dis disabled artists having been very much diminished over the last 10 years against the backdrop of austerity is one that I'm very, very um, um, responsive to. And, um, you know, we're talking at a time when yes, we've come out of um, a very difficult period for all of us, but particularly it's been a challenging and isolating period for so many of our particularly vulnerable, extremely vulnerable communities, many of whom are um, from the disabled community. And the importance of art, cultural, creative expression as part of maintaining health and well-being is something that we uh, here at the council very much recognised because we've anchored our recovery and reorientation strategy here in the borough uh, very much on the health, well-being and happiness of all of our residents from whatever circumstances they find themselves in and ensuring that it's inclusive uh, to meet our equality and diversity requirements, not just a tick box exercise, but genuinely manifesting in a way that really helps enable people. I know that we've got a lot way to go it's been as frustrating for me as a mayor over the last three and a half years at the slow pace of change at the council despite you know grabbing the institution by its neck and uh, pulling it kicking and screaming into the 21st and inclusive century that we need to all be embracing so I'm profoundly grateful and indebted to the work that the Together 2012 uh, contributes to that really vital uh, conversation and how Together we can craft and shape uh, a promising future for the borough uh, through the work of the council to ensure that we hold it to account. And as an elected representative, I am held to account in our promise to make the borough as inclusive as it has to be for all of our residents. And I just commend the work that you and the team have done for this year. I remember 2019, 2020, no, 2000. And 19 was the last festival that I attended in person. Um, so I'm really looking forward to observing and enjoying and being enriched by what you have to offer this year. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you very much, Roxana. And now I'd like to invite Colin Handbrook to put his camera and microphone on. Colin is the editor of Disability Arts Online and... Yes, and here he is. Welcome, Colin. So what we're going to do is we're just, I'm just going to have a brief chat with Colin and then we're going to introduce you to some of the artists who are exhibiting in our exhibition and the, one of the curators, Sarah Hughes, of the Open Exhibition. But first, Colin, I mean, you've been working with Disability Arts Online before anybody else was even online, haven't you? But you must have seen huge changes over the last 18 months. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, it, yeah, it's been a real ro roller coaster uh, of a journey and, um, well, for, you know, for everyone. And, but at, at Disability Arts Online, we, we, we kind of realized the, the need to respond with um uh to, to you know people suddenly losing their incomes and disabled people suddenly finding that you know themselves uh, um so many so many contracts suddenly kind of um being swept away and and and, and so we 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 found uh a budget to create a series of micro commissions um and I, I i think we've really been plugging a gap because you know every, everyone knows or all, all, all artists know that the kind of vagaries of 
trying to trying to get funding it, it can be is is such a difficult and inaccessible process and and so we we wanted to uh create something that that um you know j just involve people kind of uh, putting together a simple proposal and and um uh, you know and and having their work and um immediately showcased on 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 online um and i think what's been great this year because that was exactly in fact you know some of the artists here tonight will know that's what happened you know with us last year as well we repurposed all the money we would have spent in person we advertised for open commissions which was something we never did before you know we also got some just bits of kit quickly out to artists who needed cables and things. And what's been so great this year is we've been able to link up with Colin and Disability Arts Online so that the fund the funding round of micro commissions that went out this spring was also supported by Together and we're able to showcase some of those artists within the festival. And I'm sure that sort of partnership and conversation is something that is just going to deepen. We're both working online, we're doing very different things, but we're coming from very much kind of the same aims and objectives and goals. Really? And equally, I mean, I just think it's so much more accessible. And one of the things we wanted to do this year is say, let's not have everybody have to write a few paragraphs to both of us. Let's have them just send a few paragraphs to one of us. And, you know, if at all possible, one of us will fund them, one of us will showcase them. And, um, and I must have a conversation with your whole team after the festival about looking for some specific money from some of these other funders and donors to be able to just do more and more disability arts online commissions as we go forward. We only want this to be the start for artists. You shouldn't have to go through the Arts Council system and the grants portal and everything else in order to get a few hundred quid, which, as we all know, as artists can make a huge difference as to whether you can make work or not. I wanted to um, ask you a question before we introduce the first of our artists, Vince Laws, and that's about the way that the nature of digital work, it's changed, isn't it? You know, we have all of these pictures that have been photographed and scanned. That's not the same as our usual open exhibitions where we're seeing pictures in frames, we're seeing canvases on walls. So it has fundamentally changed it, but to me, it's also made it much more accessible in particularly in a geographic sense. You know, we have people here tonight from the European mainland, from North America, you know, we used to tour the open exhibition when there were still community venues left around those community venues following the festival, but it was still only really getting to a few people in East London. This is obviously something you've had much longer to sort of think about and consider, but I wonder really, has gallery access, even if it's an exhibition in a public space like a library, has that always really been privileged? Has it always been something that only a few people can do? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it. it I mean, it's it's um, it's 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 very you know of all of all the kind of art genres, I think visual arts are the most el elitist. It's you know most difficult to to uh, to, um, to 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 get your work shown and appreciated you know I, I i think um within the performing arts we, we see quite a, a, quite a few disabled performers who are kind of getting into large mainstream theaters and getting written up by uh the mainstream press that's not happening for our, our visual artists um and and um you know you you you're very much kind of um left on your own when, when you know the, the 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 whole the process is so elitist you know the fact that if you do get a gallery they're going to take 50 or 60 percent of any sales and and gen, generally you have you know you have to pay to get your work into a gallery and it's 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 really tough and and i i think that uh the whole online gallery space really challenges all that you can really you know, you you can play with the narrative, the stories in in your work, but through you know creating soundscapes and 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 
you know, and video and all, all kinds of different and audio description that will augment in really creative ways. Um, you know, we've got some brilliant uh, shows that have come through the micro commissions and uh, a whole kind of range of things like Pete Carr playing with, with um, uh, um, the the photo mode within gaming and and using that as as an art form and creating galleries out of that. Um, um, it's a fantastic arti for artist photographer Dexter McLean. Um, you know, kind of representing, turning the camera on on himself. You know, it's a uh, portrait photographer who's very used to photographing disabled people, but um, it gave him an opportunity to to turn the camera around and and to 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 kind of give us an insight into into his own life and uh, and I and I think it's something that's developing as well. You know, with, with yes. there. Are, things like Kunst Matrix and all these new kind of online gallery systems that are that are starting to become more popular. And I, I think you, that's something we'll invest in in the future. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because what, one of the things I found interesting and of course Vince Laws, who we're going to come to any moment, Vince, if you want to get ready to put your camera and microphone on, is another artist who's also been blogging about what he's been doing in disability arts online. Last year, two of our exhibitions were created in virtual galleries. And for anybody who's not come across a virtual gallery, it's very, very interesting because instead of having to fit your show into the gallery, you can design a gallery to fit your show but in fact all of the artists tonight decided they didn't want to do that and actually I think you'll see that in some ways it's much much more accessible to be able to scroll through images on your phone you know enlarge them zoom in if you want to see them but not kind of going you know sort of navigating in this sort of 3d way and then having to sort of go up to this virtual picture. So I'm going to say welcome to Vince. Vince, what I try and do with the miracle of modern technology is to share my screen so that you're able so and then I shall click into your exhibition to show people and perhaps you can just talk us through some of it. Sure. So I just want to flag up that at the beginning of this, you can see Vince writing, but all of the things that Vince says, you can also play the audio. So that's an option. And of course, everything has got audio description in the out tags. Vince, are you able to, um, are you able to be heard while I'm screaming? Yes, hello, how are you? <laughs> Ed, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the exhibition. Uh, I, I did a series of paintings during lockdown this year. So I started doing portraits and uh, fairly obviously, if you because of the lockdown situation, there weren't very many people I could paint. It was me or my partner and he hates being painted. So uh, it was a matter of doing some self-portraits. I started off doing, this is the first one I did in a series. And it was looking in the mirror and just painting myself quite quickly in oils. I've been painting with oils for about five years now. 
And uh, yeah, I just wanted a nice project that I could do this year to keep myself busy, distracted, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, this was the second one. And this was in acrylics and painting over the top of a, a sort of impasto on a previous canvas. And I was just trying to find a way into portraits, trying to find a way of doing them that was interesting to me and would keep me in a positive kind of frame of mind. So I looked at these first two and I decided I needed to go for something a bit happier, uh, quite deliberately so that I wasn't, I mean, I do deal with depression, anxiety, some of that stuff. So here I am looking absolutely stunning, I think you'd agree, in a blonde wig with uh, my, ha my hair over my shoulder cascading down. And uh, I actually had a, 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 somebody in the village, I live in rural Norfolk, somebody was selling six wigs, blonde wigs for a tenner, I think. So I had to have those, obviously. Much cheaper up here, wigs. And uh, yeah, so I just started doing things where I was in a good mood, things that would amuse me. So this is Boris Piffle Johnson, who's one of my alter egos. And uh, he's dressed in a very badly cut blonde wig uh, with a face mask and a clown nose and a big clown smile and a cardboard suit that's tied around the neck with a bow. And I've been doing a bit of comedy performance as Boris, but I decided to paint him there outside number 10. Here's me sniffing a sunflower. I grew some sunflowers last year in the garden because of course Van Gogh loved sunflowers. Yellow is the color of hope apparently. So, uh, and he was painting to try and console people to uh, make people think their lives were a little bit better. Uh, even though they were a pauper and they didn't necessarily have a great uh, cultural background. So they didn't have, uh, they didn't know necessarily what good taste was, but they could look at a big bunch of sunflowers and get some sense of hope from it. Uh, this is my family. This is called Holy Family 2. I've been doing uh, sort of family portraits of me and my other half and the dogs in the family. And uh, this is the one I did earlier this year. So it's got Adrian in the background with a rainbow umbrella and Jessica, my Podenko with a rawhide bone in her chops and me in the front with a neighbor's dog called Flute and Badger who's over the rainbow bridge, he's departed. So uh, he's in a little bit of uh, silver glitter over there on the side with a, well, it's actually a unicorn hat. I know it looks like a dunce, but he's actually dressed as a unicorn. And then I got this idea, why don't I paint some other people's portraits? Some of the people who were, I was looking at different artists and their self portraits. And this is quite an unusual one for Egon Schiele because he's actually got all his clothes on. Uh, usually he has them off and he's up to all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But in this particular one, he was wearing a peacock waistcoat and looking a bit of a dandy, which is kind of a look I quite like. So, uh, First of all, I painted in his head and his halo, and I copied that from his self-portrait. And it was done, his portrait was done in gouache and watercolor and black pencil. So I had to try and replicate that in oils, which was the tricky bit. And then when the top half was done, it was how am I gonna fit myself in the bottom half? And uh, so then I got my other half to try fingers in different ways and hands here and hands there. And I eventually went for this one where it's kind of like a pair of Dame Edna glasses almost. And uh, yeah, I just like that. Here's me and Van Gogh. He's looking straight ahead. And so I did more, found one with more or less the same uh, kind of look, just looking straight ahead with a milk carton squashed on my head for no apparent reason, because I'm an artist, darling. Uh, okay, so this is Tamara de Lempic, uh, who uh, I really like her art, and uh, she does these very highly stylized, polished finishes. And she did the front cover for a fashion magazine in 1925, German, the equivalent of Vogue in Germany, and it was her driving this green Bugatti. So I pushed her over a little bit and managed to fit me in the passenger seat with my dog Jessica on my knee and the wind blowing my scarf and doing a big thumbs up. And yeah, just uh, things that made that amused me a bit, really. Here's me and Picasso. And uh, yeah, I wanted to do Picasso's self-portraits quite simple in a way. So I decided I could be the other half. I could be the cubist 
uh, person in the painting. And he did a painting called Woman with a Fish Hat, uh, which I copied. Uh, and then I just did my own thing. I kind of copied it to get into the style and sort of see how I could, you know, recreate it myself. So instead of fish on my head, I've got bananas and I've got a big red jacket and I've got an OMG because I was awarded that by a queen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's Goga. Uh, he's in Tahiti. You probably know he did a lot of his painting in Tahiti. So I decided I, I had a dream about him and he's our tour guide in Tahiti. So that's me there with two palm trees coming out my head. And my other half, Adrian, found a photo of himself with six parrots. So I just thought that was too good not to use in a tropical uh, landscape. So I put him in there as well. Oh yeah, so go again. Well, there was a lot of uh, artists did their self, did uh, sort of uh, Queen of Beauty, this is called by Gauguin. And there's all those paintings where, yeah, usually, let's face it, naked women are lying out on the grass and uh, it's a male gaze and all the rest of it. So I thought it was quite nice to sort of give it a, a gay twist or a queer twist or a whatever. And so there I am lying on the grass uh, with Adrian in the background trimming kiwis and yeah, bits of symbolism, Tahiti landscape. Oh, and this was me imagining it, taking it one step further. If Gauguin was in Tahiti and Van Gogh went to meet him, like now in the 21st century, and uh, yeah, Gauguin's giving Van Gogh a sunflower and there's a dove hovering over Van Gogh's head. It's like they're getting back together and appreciating each other after all these years. That's me in the garden painting and Adrian was out there painting a chair. So I'm painting him painting a chair, which amuses me. And Jessica's in one side of the painting and out the other, which again, is just all that thing of having a bit of fun with a painting really, playing with it a bit. Okay, and then I wanted to, I was reading Van Gogh's letters and I wanted to, I wanted to give him a hug, actually. I wanted to console him. I was reading about sunflowers, as I said earlier, and how that was what he painted them for. And I wanted to give him a hug. So I literally painted myself giving him a hug and I just kind of changed his face slightly so he had a bit more of a smile on it. And then finally, this was kind of going the whole hog. And uh, yeah, Van Gogh didn't actually smile very much because he'd lost most of his teeth. And I thought that was really sad, actually. You know, when you think of all the dental problems people have now, there probably are people going around who don't smile because they don't have uh, the health care, the teeth. So here I am literally painting in Van Gogh's teeth. And uh, I'm dressed in, uh, yeah, Japanese drag, I suppose you'd call it. But I actually found a painting from about the 1700s where uh, it was a male actor playing a female role and this is what they wore. So I painted myself in that. Thank you, Vince. I, um, so I won't show it now, but there's also a wonderful page with, is it 16 images, Vince, of different stages of the painting making Van Gogh smile. I do encourage everybody to check that out later. Now, next, before we all join in discussion, I'm going to introduce the exhibition by Duncan Bridgestock because I felt like it. And we have a short video because Duncan's connection is not wonderful. What I should say is that the vid the images that I've put over Duncan speaking because we recorded this on the phone, they're just a few and because they were going on video, I just picked landscape ones. There are over 50 exhibits. I do urge you to look at them all and in the order that they're exhibited in. These are just, like I say, really quite random. They're not kind of direct representations of what Duncan's talking about. Uh, my name's Duncan Bridgestock. I've got a mental health issue. I've got OCD and I'm a hoarder. And during lockdown, I joined the Together 
2012 craft group making that uh, and still still life where I made collages um, which are featured in this exhibition and they've gradually progressed over about a year and a half. I had done collages before when I had a breakdown and was hospitalized in about 2005 and slowly I learned how to do them and this progressed to the, the current collages which you're looking at um, and I started using different materials and approaching them differently and in this I've been in, influenced by Kurt Schwitters who I call the daddy of collage um, if you don't know him, it's worth looking up his stuff because even though it was he finished, he died in the late 40s. Um, but, but a lot of his stuff still looks fresh and interesting today. And there was an exhibition a few years back at Tate, Britain, of his stuff. Although there was too much written stuff I found, but the collages are great. Um, somebody else that influenced me was the ab abstract expressionist, particularly Robert Motherwell. And some of the later collages, the black and white ones, have been influenced by that, although they're not really abstract expressionist. Uh, but that was a new departure for me, and that was quite stimulating. And that sort of takes you up to date with where I am, what I'm doing at the moment. When I started making collages, um, I started in the 1980s, well I didn't produce a, a whole lot but I was busy working at the time and it was more like a hobby and I liked um, packaging that I was throwing away and I used that. I didn't make a huge number of collages and then when I had a big, big breakdown I started making collages in hospital again and I wasn't getting any help as a psychiatric outpatient. And they kept saying, you're all right. And I kept saying, I'm not all right. And I got help from mine to a wonderful, and they provided me with counselling. And I got a counsellor who avoided playing what I call psycho tennis. So she let me know that she was on my side by um, talking about Miles Davis's kind of blue, which being a jazz fan, I knew about. And that created an, an empathy between us and a kind of channel for communication which helped enormously and I made a collage about Miles Davis based on Miles Davis's music of um, kind of blue but then I stopped making collages really for a long time and it was only when um, lockdown came along and I'd been interested in joining the together poetry group but I did some voluntary work which then stopped so I started going to the poetry group and they suggested going to the Make and Natter where I started doing collages again and then I find some uh, new interest and stimulation in making them and enjoyment and um, a progression of what I'd done before and finding some new stuff to say, like using the backs of food packaging, where a lot of the stuff that you usually look at, I thought, well, that's no good, I can't use that. And then I started finding a way to make that work. And there are some of those I like in the exhibition. The, the L shapes were really uh, looking at a lot of uh, art on YouTube and the abstract expressionists in particular. And I was aware that a lot of the stuff I was looking at, the artists had their own vocabulary vocabulary of, of shapes. And like, uh, I thought I should develop my own. I didn't know which really shapes to use. So I started using owls and that developed into um, different positionings and color combinations and eventually more symmetrically designed collages which I thought were an improvement on the early ones. The early ones tended to be quite chunky and it develops. You find that you can do more or you think well let's try messing around with that see what happens and you can arrive at different results.
it's been something to look forward to doing the Zoom meetings with Together and a way of connecting with people and having a, an immediate response that people say if they like something you've done, which is very rewarding and uh, satisfying. And it encourages you, encourages you to do more. Thank you to Together. And also thank you to my mum who's encouraged me <laughs> and told me to put the collages in binders so they don't get all bashed up in my flat. Thank you, Duncan. And Duncan will join us all in a moment for a, a chat. But next, I'm going to introduce you to the Together 2012 Open Exhibition. It's a very unusual open exhibition because usually open exhibitions ask you as an artist to pay some money for the privilege of being considered and they'll decide whether or not they'll put your picture in the show. What we say is if you identify as having a disability, an impairment, you're neurodiverse, you have a learning difficulty, anything that would make you a disabled person then, and you have a new connection, send us your work. So long as it's family friendly, we will guarantee to include it. And we've always had a very vibrant exhibition of work from amateur artists to maybe paint one or once or twice a year, people who work every week, people who are aspiring to become professional, people who are professional. And every single time, it's a wonderful show. And you really, you know, those distinctions start becoming really meaningless. The first exhibition in 2012 was you know, really the person who was absolutely fundamental to its success was Sarah Hughes, who then became a director of Together 2012. She's always done a great deal of work for the Open Exhibition and she's done a really stunning job this year because, of course, it's also involved a lot of photographing and scanning. I should also thank Alison March and the artist who's our club's programme leader. Alison has a family emergency, so she can't be with us tonight, but she sends her congratulations congratulations and best wishes to all of the artists. So let me just go back to my screen sharing and see what we can get up. Just bear with me a moment. So what I now need to do, so I'm just going to click you through. So we have the History Month website, the festival launch and exhibition openings, and here we have the Together 2021 open exhibition. And I was thrilled to discover, counting on my fingers, that we actually have 50 artists in the exhibition. That's not quite as many as we have had in sometimes in the past, but unfortunately, two of the art groups of people with learning difficulties who've often contributed haven't been able to in the last couple of years. Their services really seem to have stopped and not started again. So it is 50 pictures. I'm going to try and scroll through really slowly. And a couple of things to think about. One of the sort of if you like, kind of changes that takes pl place when work goes online is you can't tell how big it's supposed to be. So some of these pictures are much, much smaller or much, much larger compared to others, but they're all pretty much the same size online. And if I look at this very first one, which is by Sharifa Akbodi, untitled. It's postcard sized paper, you would never know. If we come on to Tony Malone, that's a much, much bigger piece of paper, but again, you would never know it. And I'm gonna just keep scrolling down. We always hang our exhibitions around themes. So pictures that sort of link to each other by color, by subject, by media. And we've been able to do that online this year for the first time, which has been a real pleasure. And Julie, feel free to say anything that you want to. And this exhibition includes pictures from, I think, all of the directors and possibly all of the team members.
Sorry, that's my magic mouse stuttering a bit. I'm not quite sure why it's supposed to be magic. I think what impresses me, as always, is the, the variety of work um, and how different media is used to express somebody's artistic vision. For example, we just had the pom-poms, which was... Uh, an installation by Crystal Peasy. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. It's really stunning. It would never have occurred to me to create a a pom-pom installation like that. So Yes, and Crystal's been doing that in art club while Duncan's been doing his collages. So, yes, I mean, it's, it's certainly... it's, But it's a range of perspectives as well. Um, some some artwork is, is very in your face. Some of it is much more subtle. Um, some of it, I think, is quite funny. Um, and I think that's intentional. I'm not, I'm, you know, I think that's, that's absolutely intentional. And some of it is just absolutely lovely. These pieces are from the art club. Yes, a special mention for these last two. The exhibition ends, for anybody who can't see it, with Tracy Vidal's pom-pom shoes. And they're red slippers that look very much like the ones that you would have to click your heels and leave Oz or indeed get home. And finally, we've got four panels by the Discover Centre's Mighty Mega Club. That's a group of young disabled people. Most of them are non-verbal. They've been contributing to our exhibitions since we started in 2012. It's been great to have them back this year. It's such a simple thing. It's neon pens on black paper, but it just looks like the most amazing firework display. And um, with assistance dogs, we don't really like fireworks, but I think this is a sort of lovely way to have fireworks to celebrate the festival. So I'm going to invite Sarah, Vince and Duncan to put their cameras and microphones on. And we've got time for a jolly good chat about art and how it's changed becoming digitally. And also we want to think about community arts. You know, is that a distinction that really matters anymore, particularly when so many people are working on Instagram? Gosh. Colin, are you able to join us again? I think that's a wonderful painting of Collins that's um, his screensaver there. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, Colin, we had an exhibition, you know, in the days when the hub was still open, we exhibited your work. It wasn't as part of one of the festivals, was it? It was part of, we were curating that gallery year round at that point, and I think it was part of the Summer Together programme. But that was a beautiful exhibition of poetry and art. It was a fantastic opportunity, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you, uh, I've 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 loved the together events that you've uh, that invited us to, and that uh, um, the, the 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 poetry um, events that you produce as well. Wonderful. Yes, I mean I won't take any time away from the visual artists, but we've got some wonderful poetry events coming up. So do check those out. Vince, did you want to start? We've had some wonderful descriptions mm. of your pictures, but I wondered, you know, more generally, and I think Colin and Duncan as well, the idea of making art during lockdown and shielding is, is something that's really important for our well-being. Yes, well, I mean, I, I use it all the time. So in a way, lockdown, I mean, you know, the, there are, have been a lot of difficult things about lockdown, but it's also been a bit of a gift for some people. And I don't mean that to, you know, be nasty to all those people who've had a difficult time, but I live up here in the middle of nowhere and it's actually been a bit of a relief that I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have to feel like I had to say no to people's events or that kind of stuff. I could just get stuck in to my own uh, project really. Uh, so I don't know if I'm a typical, I don't think I am really. <laughs> well, 
I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I wrote a you know, monologue recently about all the things that I don't miss, you know, despite the fact I haven't left the house since March 2020. And I think, you know, all of these losses bring gains, don't they? But you're right, of course, many of us have used our art for our sort of health and well-being beforehand. Did you want to add anything there, Sarah? Because you um, also run the well, art recovery group and some of the art recovery group work as yeah, well as yeah. the exhibition. So um, I think what is, uh, I, I mean, going to the groups to collect the artwork, obviously sort of like uh, digitally, but um, it was quite obvious that they, um, well, I, I actually went to Powerhouse, Ty's group, and uh, they were quite clearly very happy just to be, uh, you know, sort of like socializing together and they you know, it, it's quite, it's a special thing now, isn't it? It's sort of like we're, we're thriving on it now. Um, so they were doing really well and um, they'd, they've entered some really exciting work. Um, Art for Fun, uh, Sue Hooper's group, um, they've been busy. They've, I know they've had some, you know, some of their own challenges, but to come up with this selection of amazing work from these people is, is absolutely, you know, it's mind blowing. They, they, yeah. they've done incredible work. And, I and think um, something I've noticed really sort of in the last 18 months is how much people have progressed. Yeah. And you wouldn't mm -hmm. have expected it, would you, that if you sort of cut people off and get them to work from home, or they might have the opportunity to work digitally. You know, you might stay occupied. Yeah, so you know, um, pressures you don't yeah. expect people to progress. But all of those artists that I've seen work, I've seen before, have progressed. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And very excitingly, um, I mean, we we're showing um, David Elton from the Art Recovery Group. Um, one of his pieces is in this exhibition and I have to say the art recovery group has been busy for the last year and a half. Uh, we've managed, we've relocated into the open spaces, into the park and we've carried on but um, you know obviously with lockdown itself that we couldn't actually for those periods but um, David uh, was so resourceful that he he actually started David is, does a lot of lovely patterns and um, he, he started using cake, kitchen towel with felt tips and he did, he's done some beautiful patterns. They're actually just uh, gone on show at the, art, uh, the Garden Cafe in Custom House and um, I just think that's so resourceful, isn't it? And um, I, I think through this as well, it's like um, you find a way, you know, if, if you have the passion to cre create something, you know, you find a way. And uh, it's, it's like it may not be, the initial stage may not be exactly where you want to go with it. But, you know, it's important to start it off in some form. And then, you know, when you get that opportunity, you know, just run with it, isn't it? Or, you know, just develop it, develop that idea. Um, I loved when I was really looking at Duncan's work I think two things struck me because we've been seeing Duncan's work sort of shared on the live streams you know for quite some time <laughs> but of course the only way we can share that work is for people to hold their work up to zoom and screenshots and you know it's a very very different experience and I'm sure it's a different experience seeing the scans but there's something about the digital scans that really, really bring out the content. And I don't mm -hmm. think I'd realised till then, Duncan, that actually, you're, of course, you know, I know that you make these very, very, very carefully. But the selection of the particular items, and I thought, yes, we've all been there during lockdown, the specialist teas when we get bored but we've had too much caffeine, the occasional box of chocolates, the occasional snack bowl of cereal, you know, just occasionally we read the community newsletter that's come through, we keep taking our tablets for high blood pressure as our doses go up and down. And it was, you know, it was just a real joy to be able to sort of see really close up which, of course, is one of the advantages, as we say, of these digital spaces and also not doing it with this gallery app is that just simply by programming these images into the website, you can, if you've got the right kind of gear anyway, just zoom right into the detail. 
-hmm. And I love that because when I do go to galleries, I like to be able to get really close. I can't do that as a wheelchair user. As a wheelchair user, usually you can't even read the label because they assume that everybody can get really close, however crowded, mm -hmm. however crowded the gallery is. So it's been wonderful to see that. And we've really tried to embed kitchen recycling in particular into our work. And that's been a real change for Together because it used to be that what we were able to do was get some resources together and people could come in and help themselves and really experiment and find their own voice. And now people are really kind of dependent on what they've got at home. But I think Duncan, you know, we, we did our kitchen carnival project, which remains online and discovered that you can indeed do outdoor arts, not only indoors, but in the kitchen, just using the things you've got in the kitchen but Duncan has taken it into fine art you know and I don't think the rest of us would begin to pretend that we had and I just think it's a wonderful show Duncan I find your mm -hmm. video the introduction is really really helpful and but it's just again made me want to go out I mean I didn't know there were people doing I didn't know collage was more of an art form in the US but I can understand that because they're so into quilting you know, and to me, I know it's not always obvious, but that was the first thing I thought, oh, yes, they would, wouldn't they? I didn't know you could get collage. You know, I didn't know people were practicing collage and sharing it on things like Instagram, but I should have supposed that. But I just think that they're, they're just beautiful, beautiful collages, Duncan. And, I'm, yeah, I'm so pleased that you were able to exhibit them. And I think they work mm -hmm. very, very well with Vince's because they're both yeah. about responses to lockdown. They're, mm -hmm. they're part of practice that you did anyway, but it, from what you both say in the exhibition websites, you know, it, it did sort of fundamentally change you. Duncan, I know we don't have a great signal from you, but I'm just going to say, do you want to try and say a few words? Um, well... I'm going to take the head. No, I'm really sorry, Duncan. We are losing you. So, all I but what I would recommend to everybody is check out the exhibitions online. Uh, through lockdown, because it would have been pretty awful otherwise, and maybe something to look forward to. And it's developed my work, which I'd stopped doing. Um, and then you get all the benefits towards your mental health from having an activity that you can do which relieves stress and occupies you and hopefully increases your self-esteem by doing something you're pleased with um yes uh. thank you duncan um and i think I'd, I'd just like to pay tribute again because she can't be here tonight to alison marchant who very much oversaw our transition closing the office well, initially handing out activity opportunity to oh right sorry now. duncan oh, you. um you're sort of Yes, yes, we're, we're only getting, getting little bits, bits of you, and it's, it's nearly 8 o'clock, so, so I'm, I'm just, just going to leave it there. Like I say, I'd like to pay tribute to yeah. Alison, because she very calmly, over a couple of weeks, yeah. closed the office down in such a way that I was able to set up the web-based offer. We were able to plan how Alison could support people individually, because we, didn't move, we weren't able to move on to the phone until the summer. We weren't able to move on to Zoom until the autumn. And Alison was phoning everybody every week, supporting them, helping people to take in, you know, to run individual programs. And I think, Duncan, you're so right. If we hadn't, you know, if we just had to sort of pause together and never, you know, may never have come back together again as it happened, I think life would have been very, very different for all of us. And the fact that we were able to move without even a kind of week off into a whole new world and a whole new way of working. There's, it hasn't just been about the participants' health and well-being. I think it's been very much about the team members' health and well-being. It's been about the director's health and well-being. I know the community advisory board give very positive feedback about how proud they feel. So I'd just like to give a huge thank you to everybody. 
I always say at these festivals, I work with the best team in the world, which of course includes Sarah, who's here tonight, Emily, who's here tonight, Alison, who isn't here tonight, Kate Rollison, our newest team member, who's our youth development worker. And I also encourage you to check out Kate's work, both in the exhibition and online. Like I say, we're incredibly grateful to Arts Council England and the National Lottery Community Fund for all of their support, but the support that's closer to home and which we depend on at every event and activity is our access support. Chris Burrows is very familiar to many of us because she's kind enough not only to be incredibly flexible and good-natured, but to come back time and time again. We have Norma with us tonight, and as I said when I booked her, at least we didn't have the rain running under the tent in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park threatening to electrocute us all. But it's great to have Norma back. But we've also been working with her colleagues, including Julia, on the live streams. Global real-time captioning, we cannot praise them highly enough. And ditto Burroughs interpreting. So I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. It feels like we've just started a conversation and that's great because like I say we're going to have conversations at every event and activity right through the festival. That's what makes it live. I might do a bit less speaking and let other people speak up a bit more next time. So please do join us and in the meantime do check out the exhibitions and, and go back to them because you really can look at them over and over again. I'm just so pleased to be in a position, which I appreciate is very privileged, where we have had the money to organise events like this and to create commissions, including Disability Arts Online. So again, I'd like to say a big, big thank you to Colin for all of his support, as always, and apologies because I know that I've missed some of you. But Duncan, Vince, Sarah, you've done a wonderful job Congratulations and look forward to seeing another wonderful exhibition next year. And so it's goodbye for now from Canning Town in Newham.